Thank you very much. Um, so uh, thank you all again for your attention in the first part of the lecture. Um, so I'm going to right now I'm going to conclude the, the first phase of my talk, which is, is just a warm up of Brady flow and Euclidean space, motivating the kinds of assumptions that we're going to be looking at on energies and the structure we're going to be looking for when we go into the metric space context. And one thing that I didn't have time for in the first part of today's lecture was to talk about time discretization of the gradient flow. And this is something I really wanted to talk about, both because you know there are a lot of people at this workshop who live in a fully discrete world, and also because this time disc discretization is actually a key tool in um, studying partial differential equations with a gradient flow structure. Okay, so the time. What do I mean by time discretization? So um, I didn't have time uh, in in the earlier part of my lecture to talk about you know more general notions of continuity, lower semi-continuity. It turns out that. Even if your energy isn't continuously differentiable, you can get by um, with the existence and uniqueness theory of a gradient flow if it's merely lower semi-continuous. And if anyone's interested, I can say a little bit more about that at the end. Um, and then lambda convex, I talked about that assumption. That was the key assumption that we needed for uh, uh, uniqueness. Um, so under these two assumptions, uh, the gradient flow um, is, is well defined. You know, maybe you need a generalized notion of gradient, or maybe this is just the classical notion of gradient in Euclidean space. Uh, and if you want to discretize this ODE in time, um, a natural way is to consider an implicit Euler scheme. And so for an implicit Euler scheme, basically okay, what you do is you just say, well, the time derivative, that's, you know, a derivative is basically just change in y over change in x. So in the top, we have uh, the change um, in uh, x in the bottom, we have the change in t. So we're thinking of tau, or we're thinking of tau um, is the size of our time step. So this is a, a, a discretization of the time derivative. And then on the right hand side, instead of having x of t, we have x of m. X of m. Okay, so we're replacing our continuous time solution by a discrete time sequence. Um, this is an implicit method because x of n appears on both sides of the equation. We can't solve explicitly uh, for the for x of n in terms of the previous step, x n minus 1. And of course, we initialize the sequence with the same initial data that we chose for the continuous equation. Okay, so given that this is an implicit sequence or an implicit scheme, Given the n minus one element of the scheme, how do you find the nth element of the scheme so that this equation is satisfied? Uh, you know, this is uh, uh, something you know people in optimization uh, know very well. Um, it turns out that under the assumptions that we have on the energy, a natural thing to do is just to look for the minimizer of this new function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, this is a function of x, and I'm going to take the square uh, square distance. I guess I'm still here um, in Euclidean space. Uh, my notes jumped ahead to the metric space case. So you know you can basically see it's the same thing in the metric space case. Uh, so here we're still in the Euclidean case. So I'm just going to write absolute value of the norm squared. <clears throat> and, uh, and then plus energy. Okay, so uh, why does this, now we've converted um, this equation into an optimization problem. Why does this optimization problem make sense? Well, we're still in Euclidean space. We know that the square distance, uh, you can uh, bound its Hessian from below by a constant two. In other words, it's two convex for the positive, and then we multiply it by one over two tau. So this whole thing here is just gonna be one over tau convex. And then we're assuming that the energy is lambda convex. And so the sum of these two things is going to be one over tau plus lambda convex. Uh, and that's great because while lambda is a fixed number and, and could be negative, as long as I take my time step sufficiently small, this is going to be strictly positive. So this will be a strongly convex function. I already know my energy is lower semi-continuous. Of course, my distance is continuous. And so I know that there exists a unique minimizer to this problem. Um, so there exists a unique minimizer of this optimization problem. And then if you think, okay, well, great, you can solve this optimization problem. How does this help you up there? Um, well, uh, by looking at the, uh, you know, we know that there's kind of a, a sufficiently nice function and there exists a, a unique minimizer. We know that the derivative of that function um, must vanish with the minimizer. So if we take the derivative of this or the gradient of this um, and evaluate it as a minimizer, we know that that should be zero. 
But taking the gradient of this and setting it equal to zero is exactly saying that that equation holds up there. Okay, so, um, so this is a way of kind of solving this implicit method by converting it into an optimization problem. <clears throat> and this is a you know, very famous uh, uh, problem in, in optimization. This is often referred to as the proximal map. <clears throat> um, so this time discretization is somehow very fundamental to the gradient flow. And even at the discrete time level, we preserve two of the key properties of the continuous time gradient flow. Um, the first is that we still preserve a type of energy dissipation. This is kind of a naive observation. Um, it really follows directly from the definition of the discrete time scheme. But it turns out that along the discrete time scheme, uh, the energy is dissipated in this way. Uh, and you can see this just by saying, using the fact that x, if x, sub n, x sub n is the optimizer of this problem, of this functional, then the value of this functional x sub n is smaller than the value of this at x sub n minus one. Then if you rearrange, you get exactly this energy dissipation. So great, the energy is decreasing um, along the, the, this sort of time discretized version of the problem, just like it discretizes, it decreases in time along the continuous time problem. And we even have sort of a, an estimate. Um, and then the other key property of the continuous time problem that's still preserved at the discrete level um, is the fact that things contract. Um, you can prove, and I, I considered proving it, that I'm already running a little low on time, but we can happy to go through it later. It's just a few lines. Um, that uh, the discrete time problem contracts at the following rate. Uh, and this rate may look a little bit different from what we were talking about at the continuum time level, where we had, for example, uh, e to the negative lambda t. Uh, but if you take what's here in the parentheses and you take the scaling that my time step equals t over n and you send n to infinity, you can see that this exactly converges to e to the negative lambda at time t. So you really do recover um, the continuous um, time contraction. Okay, so these two properties mean that a lot of the time PDE people, we prefer to work at this discrete time level. Um, and so I, I think um, uh, in that sense, uh, we're kind of kindred spirits um, with the optimization crowd. Um, working at the discrete time level can simplify a lot of things and, and then passing to the continuous time limit once you have all these nice estimates is, is uh, not so much of a problem. You would have had the choice between explicit and implicit OER. Yes. You chose explicit. Can you implicit. tell us? Oh, sorry, implicit. Can you tell us what you gained by this? Or? Yes, exactly. So if you do explicit Euler, lambda convexity is not enough. Then you also need uh, you need smoothness controls over the gradient. So you need like a two sided Lipschitz condition. So I can get by with uh, with so uh, I can get by with less information on my energy here. Um, and like I said, there's lots of energies I care about, like the entropy, uh, where I'm not going to be able to get a, a, a two-sided Lipschitz estimate. I have to make, make do with something like this. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's motivated by the specific applications um, uh, that I have in mind, the types of uh, ill-behaved energies that I want to apply this to. And also, I guess I, I, I feel like the implicit method is so close it's so close to the continuous time. Like the properties are exactly the same as it's at the continuous time. So um, it somehow feels like, and the, the, the criteria for existence and uniqueness is linked exactly with what we need at the continuous time as well. Okay, so um, uh, I think I'm going, I was gonna, you know, step back and, and give a little bit of a historical perspective on, on gradient flow techniques in PDE and why gradient flow really has a long theory and long history in PDE. Um, for example, yesterday we learned about the, the heat equation. It's a gradient flow in, in the Hilbert space and L2 space of the Dirichlet energy. Um, and then on the other hand, there's been a lot of recent interest in Wasserstein gradient flows and PDEs of this type of a Wasserstein gradient flow structure of that energy. Um, I think I'm not going to go into too much detail here, except for to say that um, Hilbert spaces are really nice. If you want to do a gradient flow on a Hilbert space, things work really well. If you want to do L2, if you want to do H minus one, you know, pick the Hilbert space um, and, and, and things will be beautiful because you have this, you know, um, nice inner product structure. There's a natural way to define the gradient. 
Um, but sometimes you can't, sometimes the Hilbert space doesn't give you what you want. Um, and there's two reasons that uh, a Hilbert space not, might not give you what you want. Um, the gradient flow structure is really rigid. If you have some specific dynamics in mind, like that's what we do coming from the PD side, we have some dynamics in mind. We have, for example, a model of biological hemotaxis in mind that we want to study. And we have to sort of guess the energy and guess the metric that will give us the, the gradient flow that matches the dynamics we want. So sometimes the dynamics you have, you just can't get them. You can't guess an energy that will um, give you a gradient flow structure. Um, you know, like for example, um, well, yeah, we'll just say it, leave it at that. So sometimes that's a problem. And then other times, maybe you don't have the dynamics in mind so much. Maybe you really have the energy in mind and then you're trying to pick a metric. And then it's beneficial to try to pick a metric that will give you good convexity properties. Um, so the you know given a fixed energy, um, it could have much better convexity properties with respect to one metric or another. You know, like a very simple example is if I just picked my energy to be a fixed external potential. If I look at the convex and where v is a strongly convex function, maybe lambda convex or lambda positive. If I look at the convexity properties of this with respect to L two. This energy is just going to be zero convex. But if I look at it in the Wasserstein metric, suddenly it's strongly convex. It's lambda convex. Um, so that's another uh, consideration that can guide your choice is that the, the underlying geometry can sometimes give you better convexity properties. <clears throat> okay, and I can talk about um, the connections between gradient flow and PD a little more um, at the end. Basically, if this a uh, really rigid framework that allows us to vary a lot of other things with the PD and um, you know, can sometimes uh, shed light on the analysis. Okay, so um, uh, one of the main goals of my talk was to tell you about how this gradient flow theory in Euclidean space can be naturally generalized on metric spaces. So let's consider um, a complete metric space X and D and we want to figure out what is the analog of this gradient flow equation that we saw in finite dimensions. So as I've already argued, this ordinary differential equation turns out to be equivalent to this inequality here. So can we somehow use this inequality to define a gradient flow on an arbitrary metric space? Okay, so in order to do that, I'm going to need to somehow say what is this on a metric space and what is this on a metric space? So first, I'm going to talk about the time derivative, and this is called the metric derivative. Uh, so I have some curve in my metric space. So x takes in times in the interval 0 to t and spits out points in my metric space, so uh, some curve. Uh, and I have, uh, I can define its metric derivative um, by just evaluating this limit. So this is just saying that the distance between the curve at time s and the curve at time t divided by s minus t. Take the limit as s goes to t. Now it's totally possible this, you know, in general, this limit won't exist. Like you can have like weird curves that jump around in your metric space. Um, but uh, if this does exist, it tells us a little bit about the um, smoothness and time of our curve. And so this is going to play the role of this absolute value of the time derivative here. And sure enough, you can check that if you replace the metric here with just the Euclidean norm, this reduces to the, the absolute value of the time derivative. Um, the second quantity I need to tell you about is how we're going to generalize this, uh, the, the absolute value of, of the gradient of E. <laughs> so for this, I'm going to assume that I have um, an energy defined on my metric space. Um, another thing that I, I sort of rushed through at the beginning is, at the beginning, I was only allowing energies that were real valued. It turns out, in general, you can extend this to energies that you know maybe attain the value plus infinity. Uh, the reason you might want to do that is because that's how you can encode a constraint set. If you're doing a gradient flow and your energy is equal to plus infinity on some set, um, you're never going to flow into that set when you're, you're doing gradient of uh, evolving in the direction of steepest descent of the energy. You might worry that this constraint set would then make it, you know, setting equal to plus infinity, how do you define the gradient? There are generalizations of the gradient, the subdifferential um, that, that uh, make that possible. Okay, so in this case, if we want to define the, the appropriate notion of absolute value of the gradient, that's called the metric slope. And this is just going to be the limb soup as y goes to x of e of x minus e of y. Now I'm going to take the positive part 
and I'm going to divide by the distance between x and y. Okay, what is the positive part again? This is just the function. If I apply the positive part to a number x, that just says, give me what is, whatever is bigger, zero or s. So, okay, so if s is a number, negative number, it gives me zero. If s is positive, it gives me s. All right, so why is this the appropriate generalization of the absolute value of the gradient? Um, so first thing I think we need to talk about is what the heck is going on with this positive part? Why do I have a positive part there? Um, the point is, is that I'm doing gradient flow. I'm moving, I'm going in, in the direction of steepest descent of the energy. And so when you're doing the gradient flow of the energy, let's say I'm at some point X and I, I know the value of my energy at this point and I, I wanna do gradient flow. I don't care about, the val about what the energy is doing at places where it has higher values. I'm never gonna move in that direction. I'm a, if, if it's higher values everywhere, then I'm just going to stay where I am. That means I'm already kind of at a local minimum. Um, so really, if I'm at a point X, I only am looking for where the energy could be smaller nearby. And if there is a place, then I kind of want to move in the place, move in the direction that makes me smaller more quickly. Okay, so that's why I have this positive part here. Because if I'm at a location X, I'm looking around and I'm trying to look for where E of Y is smaller than E of X, or in other words, where E of X minus E of Y is positive. <laughs> and then I divide by the distance between x and y. And so, uh, again, if, if you take this and you replace the, the, the metric with just the standard Euclidean norm, you'll see that this reduces to the absolute value of the negative part of the gradient, of the, where the gradient jumps down. That's another way to say it. Okay. Um, okay, so, and, and luckily, this always exists. Uh, we don't have to worry about questions of existence there because you have to hold them soup. Um, okay, so now we have a general, we have a, an analog of this, we have an analog of this, so we can define um, an analog of this full equation. Um, the only thing that could be a little funny is the time derivative on the left hand side, you know, um, does this time derivative always exist? So what I'm going to do to, to sidestep around that is I'm actually going to integrate this equation in time. So when I integrate this from t to s, that's just going to uh, turn into a difference and then I'll have some time integrals over here. <clears throat> Okay, so when I do that, I arrive at the definition of something that's called a curve of maximal slope. So I'll say X, I'll, this is a blank I'll fill in in a moment, is the curve of maximal slope of an energy with initial data X naught. If at time zero, my curve starts with X naught and the following inequality holds. Uh, the value of the energy at time X of T minus the value of the energy uh, at time s, has to be less than or equal to, so you can see this is the time integral of that, and so I now want to say less than or equal to the metric analog of the time integral of that. And this has to hold uh, for all s uh, smaller than little t on some interval from zero to t. Okay, so does this make sense? Well, we can see sort of roughly by looking at it that this uh, is kind of the time integrated version of what we had at the top. Um, but the one thing that we need to specify is we're not always sure that this limit exists. You know, your, your curve could be jumping around in, in some weird way so, so that it doesn't. Um, so we need to add a little bit of an extra um, hypothesis here to ensure that this limit exists. Uh, and that hypothesis is we're going to assume that X is something called a two absolutely continuous curve. So it takes in values in this time interval, it spits out locations in my metric space, and we're gonna say that it's too absolutely continuous in case uh, the metric slope is squared interval. Okay, so this imposes a kind of you know weak notion of regularity in time. Um, in particular, this ensures that it's continuous um, in, in the metric space, but it's a little bit stronger than continuous. Um, and here I mean that this, not only does this exist almost everywhere, but um, that then when I take its integral, uh, as the integral of its square, it's finite. Okay, so once I add in that extra assumption, now things 
are all good because I know that taking the integral of the square of that is allowed. This is something that that, um, that exists. It, this is never going to be plus infinity, so I'm never going to end up in a situation where this is less than or equal to minus infinity. That would be complicated. Um, okay, so this is a reasonable definition. Um, something uh, that I think can be an obstruction to learning about gradient flow in metric spaces and in the Boston standard metric is there's actually a bunch of equivalent definitions or a bunch of definitions of gradient flow that are equivalent under some assumptions. Um, so I actually could have picked a variety of different definitions to talk about here. So let me just say a few words about why I picked this definition. The thing that I like about this definition is first, you can read off right from the definition that the energy is decreasing on, along the flow. Um, since this is such a fundamental part of gradient flow, uh, I like that it's sort of immediately apparent from, from the de definition because uh, T is greater than or equal to S and the right hand side is negative, we automatically get that E of X of T is less than or equal to E of X of S. It's giving us this energy dissipation it's baked into the definition. Uh, the other thing I like about this definition is that this definition doesn't immediately appeal to specific convexity properties of the energy. Um, now, don't get me wrong, like I love, I love lambda convex energies, but as I've already mentioned, there are some generalizations, maybe like an omega convex energy. And I like a definition that doesn't, um, that kind of is robust enough that it, it works for energies with different types of convexity properties. Um, you know, whatever, whatever assumptions you need to impose to ensure uniqueness, you can. It's not something that's baked into the definition. Okay. Yes. What would be a definition that uses second order information to define it? In the evolution context? variational equality that Jan was talking about yesterday. So there he only set it in the convex case, um, but you can do a lambda convex analog of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the parameter lambda would appear. So actually, talking about, yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember when I, you know, first learned about all this and, you know, the word metric is uh, being thrown around quite a bit and, you know, we do gradient flows in metric spaces. But if you come from a, a computer science background, when you think about a metric space and you're thinking about a discrete space with like, you know, a graph metric maybe uh, down on this and this completely collapses, right? I mean, there's this, this in a way requires to have like, you know, continuous curves between points. Like we're talking about spaces. And I think maybe this is what Sinho was hinting at when he asked about, you know, it almost has a Riemannian structure. Like all these curves being AC2 sort of gives you some sort of a, you know, error set for a differential structure on this space, right? Like, uh, can, can, is any of this working in a discrete setting? Well, I mean, as as Jan, you know, pointed out last night, we can we can come up with examples of metric spaces in which no no you know um, continuous curves exist. Um, and so, uh, you know, okay, then 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 you would have to kind of maybe think of a different definition. I guess if you if I were going to try to do something on a, a discrete space with a metric where no continuous curves um, exist then I, I would probably try to think of it as a discretization of a, of a different problem and then, and then define the gradient flow at, at the continuum level. Um, so yeah, I guess to me, gradient flow is inherently a continuous, a continuous time thing. Um, and so I don't feel like it's, it's uh, when, when defining it on a metric space, it seems natural to me that continuous curves must exist in order for it to be well defined. Um, but but yeah, it would be interesting. Um, so and, and maybe I'll come to this in, in a moment. Um, a key assumption for, for uh, that I'm going to talk about today for us to get existence and uniqueness in this is a convexity assumption on the metric space. And then to test convexity, you have to test there, you have to test it along geodesics. There have to exist geodesics um, between points. Um, so yeah, there, there definitely is some some continuity baked into this, but I'm still now, yeah, you yeah, now I need to come up with a question of, or an example of a metric that you agree is very far from Ramanian, but where we can have a curve of maximal slope exist. Because I, I, I think we maybe we can come up with an example of that. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, all right. So great. We have a, an analog of um, gradient of a definition of gradient flow in a metric space. Um, but a lot of questions remain, just like in the in the Euclidean space. You know, when when do these exist? Um, we, we want to, so in the audience, please see if you can come up with an example of existence on a really weird metric space by the end of this talk. Um, you, when do they, when are they unique? What are their key properties? Um, and to what extent does this coincide, uh, you know, this definition, which seems very far from the PDEs I was mentioning at the beginning. Why does this definition coincide with the PDEs that I was mentioning at the beginning in the case that the underlying metric is the fossil stain metric? Okay, so, um, just like in the Euclidean space, 
convexity or you know generalized notions of convexity such as lambda convexity or omega convexity is going to play a key role and in euclidean space we tested convexity along lines between points and now we're going to test them along geodesics in our metric space so we need to define what is a geodesic um, and so i'll say that uh, a curve that you know takes in times and spits out locations in my metric space uh, is a geodesic um if if <laughs> uh if the following holds um the distance between my curve at time alpha and my curve at time beta is equal to is uh equal to the um difference between alpha and beta times uh the distance between the curve at, at time one and time zero Okay, so basically, uh, one way to interpret this is that the curve is moving sort of at constant speed uh, with respect to the metric structure. And for that reason, this is often even called a constant speed geodesic to kind of emphasize that property of it. Okay, so the beliefs point, sometimes these things don't exist. Um, so, uh, but this is the definition. Um, and then how I'm going to, de to define convexity in a metric space context is I'm going to say that some energy I have is lambda convex. Um, if for any points um, in my metric space, there exists a geodesic. Okay, so now I'm assuming that, that uh, geodesics exist between points from X naught to X1, um, so that the following inequality holds. Um, it's exactly the, the generalization of what you would expect um, from the Euclidean space. So the value of the energy along the curve at time alpha is less than or equal to one minus alpha the value of the energy along the curve at time zero plus alpha times the energy along the curve at time one. If I didn't write anything else, this would just be convexity. Um, but because I say lambda convexity, I allow it to have kind of a, a quadratic term depending on lambda. Uh, and I won't go into details, but you can write this for omega convexity as well. Okay, so. Um, all right, so we have a notion of convexity um, in metric spaces. Uh, is this everything we need to get these things? Um, well, it turns out that when you actually want to prove that a, a curve of maximal slope it exists, um, you actually go back to that same time discretization we were talking about in Euclidean space. Um, that's how you construct the, the curve of maximal slope is by solving the sequence of minimization problems. Um, so this time discretization works great, uh, even at a metric space. Uh, so we define it in exactly the same way. Um, given the n minus one step of this discrete time scheme, we can define the n step uh, to be the minimum of the analogous quantity, except for now, instead of the uh, uh, Euclidean norm, I have just the metric square plus the energy. Um, in a metric space context, this is often referred to as a minimizing movement scheme, um, dating back to the work of DeGiorgi, or um, Jordan Kinderler and Otto um, popularized the scheme in the, in the case of a uh, Wasserstein metric when, for the Fokker-Planck equation. Um, it, in fact, it has become so popular, I think it is somehow the most cited SIAM article of all time or something like this, uh, that for this reason, people have now stopped calling this minimizing movements and often even call this JKO, even when the distance isn't the Wasserstein metric. Um, but yeah, maybe minimizing movements was a slightly better name for general, uh, general distances. Um, okay, so, uh, so we knew that this made lots of sense at the Euclidean span, uh, level. Uh, do we always have a minimizer of this problem um, in the metric space case? Uh, it, you know, is this problem well defined? Um, so one easy sufficient condition under which it's definitely well defined is that if the square distance is convex. Uh, or excuse me, if it's it, I so I put one half the square distance and I want it to be one convex or you know, the square distance itself is two convex. So if, if this is uh, one convex, um, and that holds, you know, for whatever uh, reference point x naught I'm evaluating it at, uh, then as long as my energy is lambda convex, that's sufficient uh, for there, uh, and, and lowers any continuous, for there to exist a unique minimizer of this optimization problem. Um, Can yes? I just point out that this, this method is the proximal point method. That's exactly what it 
Yes, uh, yes, and I, yes. So why are people inventing new names for it? Uh, that's a fair question. <laughs> but yeah, no, I thought this is often referred to as the proximal map. Um, you know, even but, even in the 60s, I think Moreau was, was using this sort of right. in, in the dimensionals, but yeah, so, um, so yeah, that's a fair question. Why, why not just call it the proximal point method? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, so as long as, so of course in Euclidean space, this is convex. And so then you have the whole thing would be one over tau convex, this is lambda convex, you add them together, pick tau small enough, and it's a strongly convex optimization problem. Um, so that's great if your square distance is one convex, and, and we have a, a special name for metric spaces like that. Those are metric spaces with non-positive curvature. Uh, and uh, we know that this is an important uh, property in optimization and the optimization lectures we heard on the first day, they often restrict um, to consider um, Ramanian manifolds which have non-positive curvature. Because um, you know, in that case, this proximal point method behaves really well. Uh, unfortunately, the Wasserstein metric is not this type of metric space. In fact, it has positive curvature. Uh, so things start to break down for us um, right away. So we need to figure out what to do with this Proximal point method or minimizing the hit scheme um, uh, when the square distance um, is not convex. Sorry. Yes. You need the convexity of the of the metric or of the square of the metric only for for uniqueness, right? Yes. So, in general case, lower semi-continuity would actually be enough to define this yes. movement scheme. Yes, in, indeed. And um, I think I the reason why I am talking about it, this, it, so I have to introduce, I've already introduced lambda convexity to fit uniqueness of the continuum time gradient flow. Indeed, I don't need lambda convexity here. There will exist some minimum. Um, but the, the metric space theory, is best developed in the case of lambda convexity along generalized geodesics. And I think the best way to motivate the need for generalized geodesics is at the level of this optimization problem. But you're right that uh, this is a little bit more of a pedagogical uh, approach as opposed to necessary conditions. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what about if the square distance is non-convex as it is in the, in the Wasserstein case? Um, so then we need a, a slightly stronger convexity assumption. Um, so this is maybe most precisely defined only in the Wasserstein metric, but I'm going to sort of steal the definition there and, and pose it on an arbitrary metric space. So I will say that an energy, you know, on my metric space is lambda convex along generalized geodesics. So this is going to be a stronger convexity assumption than what I mentioned before, which was just lambda convex along geodesics. This is going to require that convexity inequality to hold along more curves, not just geodesics. Um, uh, and this is going to be true if for um, any points in my metric space, we'll say we have an x naught, an x1, and an x tilde, um, there exists a curve between them. So a curve xt connecting x naught to x1. such that uh, uh, this function here, which I'll define as phi sub x in minus one of x, function of x. Okay, but rather than, I'm gonna say, it, we could consider its value to general x tilde, such that this uh, is one over tau. Uh, plus lambda convex. Okay, so this is a, a weird definition. Um, what I'm saying here is that if I just consider geodesics between points x0 and x1, I don't necessarily know if this function is going to be convex along geodesics. But it turns out that in some metric spaces, like the Wasserstein metric, you can find these other curves that it is convex along those other curves. And you can show those other curves exist and connect any two points. Um, so it's somehow a, con a convexity assumption on a richer class of curves. So question. Yes. So to quantify is for every tau? Uh, let's say for tau sufficiently small. So I will say um, for tau 
uh, I'll, I'll require this to be positive, for example, one over tau. So if, if lambda is um, positive, uh, then it could be for all tau. Um, if lambda is negative, it's for tau sufficiently small. Um, so, so I'm going to abbreviate this assumption as uh, uh, lambda convex on generalized geodesics. Okay, so once we have so once we have this assumption, this is exactly what we need to get uniqueness of solutions to this minimization problem. As Leon pointed out, existence of solutions isn't a problem, but you might worry that there are two. But if there are two solutions, all you need to do is connect them with one of these general curves because your energy is going to be strictly convex along it. Um, it shows that those two points actually had to be the same. They were both going to be minimizers of this energy. So that's what gives you uniqueness. Um, and this assumption also turns out to just be uh, important for developing the theory of curves of maximal slope on a metric space um, in, in the nicest way, um, which is the setting I, I wanted to uh, give for this kind of introductory. <laughs> Um, and so, in, in particular, in Ambrosio, Julian Savare's um, 2005 book, um, they show that if our energy is lower semi-continuous, okay, proper, I mean, we can't equal plus infinity everywhere, um, and lambda convex along these generalized geodesics, then for any initial condition in V of E, so this is just a little uh, notation, uh, I take D, D of E, this is just the domain of the energy, because since now I'm allowing my um, my energy to equal plus infinity. You know, these are just the points for the energies, not plus infinity. Um, so for any um, initial condition, as long as the energy is not plus infinity there, uh, then it turns out that there exists a unique curve of maximal slope. Um, furthermore, uh, the energy dissipation equality holds. In particular, what that means is that if you come back up to this definition of curve of maximal slope, actually equality holds there. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of part of that energy dissipation, by because that energy dissipation inequality holds, then we actually know that our evaluating our energy along the flow is sufficiently regular that we can differentiate it. Um, we get a contraction just like we had uh, in the Euclidean case. Uh, you can also do this for omega convex, not semi-convex. Uh, and then you can also get uh, rates of convergence on the time discretization. You can prove that the time discretization uh, converges at an order tau. And tau is the time step. All right, so, um, so now we, we've seen how to take the, these key ideas from Euclidean space gradient flow and to adapt them um, into a metric space uh, constant context um, uh, and, and get a lot of the same nice results that we had in Euclidean space. So uh, what remains uh, to be seen is how this metric space perspective um, connects it all to those PDEs that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, this definition of a curve of maximal slope somehow seems, seems kind of far away uh, from those equations. So now I'm going to zoom in on the Wasserstein gradient flow context and tell you what are the special things about the Wasserstein metric that allow us to take something that's just a curve of maximal slope, just satisfies this it's sort of inequality and characterize it as a PDE. <laughs> Sorry, I have a question. Yes. Um, in, the, uh, in the Hilbert space context, Bracey's theory shows us that you can also extend the gradient flow to data which has infinite uh, infinite energy with some smooth. And, and so this can happen here too. I could have put closure of the domain. So you can get some fine. density of the domain in the whole metric space uh, or some. You can do it on the closure of the domain. Yeah, the mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. But I guess only for lambda convex functions, right? Yes. Okay, okay so now we're going to zoom in on this Foster Stein case. So we're considering um, the space of probability measures with finite second moment, as I uh, was introduced yesterday, endowed uh, with the two Wasserstein metric. Um, so how does a curve of maximal slope relate to PDE in this case? Um, and so I'm going to talk about three key properties of Wasserstein metric, um, which were kind of proved in the way that I'm going to state them by Ambrose, usually, and Savare, though they really date back to earlier works, especially by Benjamin and Benjamin. 
<laughs> so the first very special thing about the Wasserstein case is that it turns out that if you have a curve in that metric space, which is too absolutely continuous, So, you know, at first glance, this is just something that takes in time and spits out things in our metric space, spits out probability measures. Um, but in fact, because of this regularity in time, you can show that there exists a velocity field. You don't know what it is, but it exists. Such that rho is a solution of the continuity equation. And furthermore, that the L2 norm of that velocity field with respect to rho is exactly this metric derivative. Okay, so this is where PDEs come into play. It's that somehow, just by being sufficiently regular in this Wasserstein metric, you get for free a characterization in terms of a PDE. And here, I mean, you know, a weak solution and duality with bounded continuous functions. Yeah, so, yeah I've got you. So, so what, how is the solution? Yeah, a, a, a weak solution and, and the do, or sorry, let's say in the duality with continuously compactly supported functions. So these are functions from RD types of. So is the vice versa true? So suppose I have a flow and it's a weak solution of the P. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Can I as long as this holds? And, and, and is this is square integrable. So you need that and then it's AC2. Yeah, they they care, they prove this very nice characterization. Um, uh, and so you know from a uh Kind of the moral perspective, this really is dating back um, to the work of Benamou and Bernier. Uh, this is in some ways just a different way of looking at the result. Um, so this is something that's really nice about, about the Butler side setting is you get this sort of beautiful PD characterization that occurs with sufficient time regularity, and you're able to link that PD characterization to the metric derivative. Is there a short formal moral proof for this interesting statement? Uh, uh, I, I, no, I'm not, I probably is, but I, I don't have one off the top of my head. Um, uh, okay. But you can say that uh, the solutions are pushed forward, so the characteristics typically for the continuity equation. That's what uh, at the end. So, but the, the why would having this regularity in the Wasserstein sense? So, if it's that, if it's a curve, then you say define the, uh, okay, the, so let's say it's all densities, so you can define. Uh, an optimal transport map that pushes the initial condition to the something at time t. Uh, uh, and then you can say, and those densities solve some ordinary differential equation because those densities are sufficiently regular in time. And so I guess then there has to exist a velocity field driving those densities. And then you can do it. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Depends on if that is what you had in mind for a simple proof. Yeah, well, I'm not sure if it was. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, Okay, uh, so all right, so this is the first special property of the of the Wasserstein case. Um, so now I'm this is a pro special property of the Wasserstein metric, and now I'm going to start linking together uh, where the Wasserstein metric works with these energies, which have these kind of key assumptions of you know lower semi-continuity and lambda convexity along generalized to geodesics. <laughs> uh, so the next key property is that uh, for uh, for any element of the subdifferential, and this is something that I have uh, shamefully not defined at all. I intended to define it in the RD case, but I didn't have time. But let us just say it's kind of a generalized notion of gradient that makes sense for um, lower semi-continuous functions. It really comes straight from that above the tangent line inequality that I mentioned for lambda convex functions. So you can think of this as sort of a type of gradient. Um, uh, we have a chain rule. So this is a thing that is going to look familiar. So you can differentiate the energy along a two absolutely continuous curve. And what you get is sort of the thing that plays the role of your gradient. 
And whereas normally here, I would kind of write the direction of that the curve is evolving in, like rho dot of t. Now I'm going to write the velocity field that's driving that evolution. <laughs> okay, so uh, what's underlying this is the sort of pseudo Ramanian structure of the Wasserstein metric, is what gives us this uh, chain rule. Okay, um, so this is something that's very special about the Wasserstein metric. Um, and then the last thing that I will say um, works for energies whenever their sort of first variation is well defined. Um, and uh, that means if you consider perturbations of the energy um, kind of along lines, so you know, considering the value of the energy at rho plus, say, T mu minus uh, E of rho divided by t, um, if I can write this, the limit as t goes to zero of this as uh, the integral of this quantity um, against mu. Okay, so if you're, sometimes you're introduced sufficiently nice that this is no problem. In fact, for all of the energies I mentioned, this is no problem, um, but you can intercount for some weird energies for their problems. Sorry, for, for the subdifferential, does that mean you compose E with rho and then compute the subdifferential of a real function, or is it the subdifferential no. of E? This is the subdifferential of E oh, okay. um, evaluated at that point. Does yes. need a balance space structure for defining a subdifferential? Uh, no, uh, uh, but I didn't tell you how to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that is, this is something that is defined in Ambrosio, Julie, and Savare. Oh, okay. And it basically is just done. You know, using that above the tangent line um, functional, and and it's you you use the sort of formal inner product uh, 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 for the Wasserstein metric to stand in for the inner product that you saw in the Euclidean oh. space. So yes, I'm I'm hiding a, a lot here, but I guess my goal was just to extract what are these special things from Wasserstein that make connect curves of maximal slope to these nice PDEs, and the reason I wanted to extract them is because it turns out that people are cooking up a lot of interesting metrics based kind of taking Wasserstein as their inspiration that preserve a lot of these properties. And then they can still study a lot of interesting PDUs. So that's why I wanted to, to kind of call these things out. It may not be so easy to find these things in the wild for an arbitrary metric that you pick up, but maybe you can uh, modify the Wasserstein metric um, in, that preserves these in some way, and you can still get some interesting gradient flows to study dynamics um, that you're interested in. Okay, so in this last case, when we do have a, a first variation, um, then it turns out that the first variation is closely related um, to the subdifferential. In fact, uh, the, the gradient of the first variation is an element of the subdifferential. Uh, and we can get a nice characterization of this um, metric slope that we defined. The metric slope is the L2 norm of the gradient of this first variation. Okay, so uh, you know it's pretty pretty special property of, of W2 that we get this sort of nice expression um, for both the subdifferential and for the metric slope. In terms of, you know, I'm not sure how familiar this is, but but to as kind of a PDE person doing gradient flow in Hilbert spaces, this is a very familiar quantity. Okay, so these three key um, properties of Wasserstein metric allow us um, to connect the curve of maximal slope to the PDE. They give us the following theorem: uh, If we have a curve of maximal slope uh, rho x t, so this is just you know, a, a curve in the space of probability measures that satisfies that inequality, um, then it turns out that uh, it satisfies this continuity equation. Okay, so I am going to give a short proof of this using these three facts um, that I've told you, these special properties of the Wasserstein metric. But uh, <laughs> the reason I can do a short proof is because there's not too much deep now. I've hidden all the deep things in these other properties. Okay, so how are we going to prove this? Um, well, because 
um, by the first point I made, um, if rho is a curve of maximal slope, in particular, that ensures that it is a two absolutely continuous curve. So by the first point, I know that there exists uh, a velocity field V uh, such that um, my uh, curve is a solution of the continuity equation with V, with the velocity field V. Um, so thus, it suffices to show that this V is equal to negative that. Okay. Um, okay, so that's that's what I want to do. Um, I somehow need to do this using the definition of a curve of maximal slope. Um, so uh, like I already said, for, for kind of sufficiently nice energies, energies that are uh, lower semi-continuous and lambda convex along generalized geodesics, um, it's no problem uh, to actually uh, to differentiate the energy. Um, and we had this chain rule up here. So I'll just copy that and bring it down. Okay, and then now I'm just going to use that same inequality I've been uh, using all day, which is the uh, a times b is greater than or equal to negative a squared over two minus b squared over two with equality only if a equals negative b. And I'm going to say that this here is greater than or equal to uh, negative one half. Uh, oh, um, one other observation is I need to use part three, that this is an element of the subdifferential. So the, the C I choose here can be this one. Okay, so now I'm gonna use this inequality to say that this is greater than or equal to the first variation of E taking its gradient with respect to L2 minus uh, the L2 norm of, of the velocity. Okay, um, and then I've already identified what these things are. So, thank you. Uh, I've already identified uh, what these things are. Um, so this here was exactly the square of the, um, of the metric slope. And this here, we already said the L2 norm of the velocity, this is exactly the metric derivative. Um, and then uh, finally, by what is the definition of a, oops, I'm gonna erase it. What is the definition of a curve of maximal slope? Um, well, if we go back to the definition, we can see a curve of maximal slope was if this inequality held. Now I already know that because my energy is sufficiently nice, I can actually take the limit as time goes to t goes to s, dividing both sides. And now this just becomes an upper bound on e x of t in terms of uh, uh, this quantity evaluated at x of t and, and this quantity at r, at r of t and this eval evaluated at r of t. So curve of maximal slope tells me um, that I, uh, I get um, that this here is an upper bound for the time derivative of my energy. And that's exactly what I need right here. So this is the thing that you would have on the right-hand side of a, a, a curve of maximal slope. And I know that that's an upper bound for the time derivative of my energy. Okay, so in other words, I know that um, actually equalities must hold throughout and because here I use that this, this inequality where equality only holds if A equals negative B, I'm able to conclude that V actually equals negative the gradient of the first variation of E with respect to rho. Uh, so that was what I needed to show. <laughs> okay, um, so, and okay, this is true. Uh, well, almost everywhere, but that's fine for our translation. Okay, so I think I will um, stop there. Uh, if I also have a few remarks on kind of convexity things in the Wasserstein said, so I'd be very happy to, if anyone wants to 
discuss those uh, details later. Clearly, um, a key uh, assumption in everything I'm doing is that you need some sort of convexity properties on the energy. Um, sometimes it needs to be this lambda convexity along generalized geodesics. Sometimes just lambda regular lambda convexity is enough. Sometimes even sort of generalized convexity, like omega convexity, is enough. So happy to talk about that more offline if you're interested. Uh, so my question is about the, the other direction of this theorem. So if you have a weak solution of this P, mm -hmm. in proportion of the three that it is a curve of maximum mm -hmm. and in particular the local three that is this P. Yes. For any well, uh, I, I, you need you still need this sort of like that the, the um, I guess you would need that it's a weak solution of this PD and you would need some square integrability of the velocity field with respect to rho. So in time. Um, I guess. So suppose, no, okay, suppose that somebody gives gives you the porous medium equation. Yes. Uh, does this imply that the you know, weak solution is? Uh, so I guess, of course, you would need to like, yes, yeah, so somebody gives me a solution of the porous medium equation. Um, okay, I would, I would first need to, yeah, I would, I would say, what kind of solution um, do you have in mind? So I would need to prove that their notion of solution implied that it was a weak solution of the porous medium equation. Their notion of solution would also come with some regularity in time. That regularity in time would probably uh, you know, be enough in order for me to get like whatever bound I wanted on the uh, the the time regularity uh, of this PDE, and in particular, it would improve this. It apply this time regularity in the AC two sense. Okay. Yes. So, uh, I think what you meant to say that you look at the equation in the sense of distribution, and, and and on top of that, you are going to assume some integrability condition. What actually inside the divergence, you are going to assume some integrability condition mm -hmm. that. And that, that is enough to tell you that uh, you are on the versus time space and what is inside the dependent vector, and then uh, you get that. Uh, so, so, so there are some. Uh, so, but I need to know that there exists a solution that satisfies those integrability conditions. Yeah, yeah, so, 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 so I am going to say. I look at uh, the equation of the torus medium, torus medium equation, which satisfies some additional integrality. But there might be no solution that's a principle, there might be some no solution that satisfies those integrality. So, so the theorem will be assume that, uh, so torus medium probably go to the power n. Right? Right. So assume that n belongs to itself and interval. I know that I have a solution to the torus medium. And second, I know that it will be. Known. Just uh, wanted to ask, is there a way to uh, have gradient flow or like a curve of maximal slope like well defined when, uh, uh, when your metric space is positive curve and the uh, functional of interest is like not uh, lambda CGG? Yes. Uh, I've just picked this assumption because this is where the theory is most beautiful and well developed. So I thought it was most appropriate for an introductory lecture. Um, indeed, you don't need lambda CGG to get existence of a gradient flow in that case. You do need some coercivity, as you know, Professor Montanari was already pointing out. So that can play the role. Um, so yeah, as long as you have lower semi-continuity and some coercivity, um, it's fine uh, for existence. Mm -hmm. And you can even get uniqueness, even with just regular lambda convexity properties, not lambda convexity CGG. You just have to know a bit more about the energy to some things by hand. This is just the case in which the, the theory fits together nicely. And interestingly, in the Wasserstein case, while lambda CGG is a stronger assumption than usual lambda convexity along the six, we don't have any examples of energies for which we can see a strict, like all of the energies we care about in practice, if they are lambda convex along geodesics, they are also lambda CGG. So, sort of effectively in practice, it is, it is not a much stronger assumption. Gotcha. So, 
So, so this may be a naive question, but uh, so when you went from Euclidean space to uh, general metric spaces, uh, you took a particular cat transition, and then uh, at least the way you presented it, you just took the right things which you thought could be generalizable, and then went ahead with it. Can you talk a little bit about like why some other approach of whether people are trying to like more? I mean, why this is natural, and how how people decide that it's natural? Or, um, I'd say my best, the, the, why it seems natural to me, or, um, uh, though we have a lot of experts in the audience who probably know much more about the history than I do, is I would say it's really natural compared to the time discretization. I think people really started working at the discrete time level and, and then wanting to pass to the limit as tau goes to zero. And you can write an exact analog of this curve of maximal slope definition, um, which I guess I have up at the top there, you can write an exact uh, analog of that in discrete time along the discrete time sequence. Um, and so uh, it, it just, it, it, and it follows, it's pretty direct. I mean, it's not too bad to go just using this fairly simple definition here to kind of cook up a discrete time version of this. Um, and so I guess I would say maybe that's one of the reasons um, this is, uh, was the way in which they chose to Extend the theory. <laughs> uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, this is that's a great lecture. Um, and um, I'm, I mean, somehow the setting here is always a metric space. But if you, I don't know, consider something a little bit more general for the D, to so say D is uh, one of those pseudo or quasi metric or something like that. And specifically the quasi metric, say when you lose a symmetry. I mean, is there anything like this, like at, uh, at this level of generality where people can talk about curves of maximum slope and, you know, connections with the uh, Finslerian geometry, et cetera, et cetera? Or... I I'm not aware of that, but I think there may be some other people who have looked at the. Yeah, okay. So, unfortunately, we, we had to deal with this uh, in our uh, uh, upward scheme, versus if you look at the upward scheme, then. If the symmetry is lost, it's uh, quasi-metric. So the distance is no longer uh, symmetric, right? And I just have one remark there to make, which was noted by Sturm and collaborator, right? Is that in a quasi-metric space, convexity is not the right notion for stability. So you can have convexity, there's convexity and yet not have stability. There is some skew convexity that needs to be considered for stability. So that was kind of interesting uh, that, okay, that's one of the things where convexity is not the right thing to look at. But uh, kind of, let's say, in our setting where there is still a quadratic structure, actually this uh, slope, because you only go forward, so you don't care so much about symmetry, the existence actually does go through. So this is so robust that it even works in quasi-metric spaces. So yeah, as this is an as, example of the type as, of work where yeah, they're existence, able to generalize this. Right. So you can consider also a, a case of, so you start with a, a Lagrangian. And you define a cross function through the Lagrangian. With that, you can also have the same minimizing, the same idea of proof to work through the instance. And of course, for the Lagrangian, you yeah. don't have a uh, mystic structure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.